Good morning from Glasgow COP26. My name is Warren Evans. I'm from the Asian Development Bank, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to moderate uh, this panel this morning to discuss scaling up adaptation finance in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, I also want to start off by thanking the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank for co-hosting this, uh, this event with us. Uh, let me first introduce our panelists, and uh, then we'll go into some questions. Uh, first on my left is Sir Danny Alexander, who's the Vice President for Strategy, Policy, and Budget at AIIB. Next to Danny is Joe Puri, who is the Associate Vice President of EFAD, the International Fund for Agriculture Development. Uh, to her left is Eddie Ejaz, the Senior Advisor for Global Center on Adaptation, uh, formerly a colleague at the World Bank. Um, and then and finally, and certainly not least, Carlos Sanchez, who's the Executive Director of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. So this morning, we're, we're really going to focus on, on how to scale up adaptation finance. We know that climate change is the most serious long-term challenge any country faces, but particularly developing countries and particularly developing countries in the Asian Pacific. The, the threats to their social and financial sustainability of development that's taken place over the last couple of decades is, is severe and serious today and going to increase in terms of severity. Estimates show that global annual adaptation costs in developing countries alone are in the range of $70 billion and expected to reach $140 billion to $300 billion by 2030 and $280 billion to $500 billion by 2050. So obviously additional financing will be required to meet such costs, especially in the current situation where countries are so stressed for, for cash, for their economies are suffering the results of uh, COVID and they're trying to recover. It's in this context that AIB and ADB uh, brought together this panel to discuss the challenges and opportunities for scaling up climate adaptation finance in Asia and Pacific and the role that we might play and our sister organizations. So I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, a series of questions. The first question is to all of us uh, and I'd appreciate if we can limit the response to about three minutes so we can get through all the questions uh, for the panel. So for, for all panelists, um, the recently published Global Landscape of Climate Finance Report 2021 revealed that mitigation finance accounted for 93% of total climate finance over the period 2019 to 2020 while adaptation finance accounted for just 5% of globally tracked climate finance. The remaining 2% is a combination of both. What would increasing ambition for climate adaptation finance mean to each of your organizations in order to demonstrate the urgency of raising higher levels of finance to scale up investments in climate adaptation? So Danny, I'd like to start with you, please. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you, Warren, for hosting this panel. Um, so, AIB is an institution like ADB based in Asia, and we know that Asia is particularly vulnerable to the impact of, of, of climate change. Many coastal communities, and many people living in areas that are vulnerable to, to flooding, to cyclones, and, and, and so forth. And so, it means, I think, for any, any institution operating in Asia, we have to be particularly conscious of the uh, impact of climate change. Uh, for AIB, we set out to be a green institution from the very start. AIB was created just after the Paris Agreement was, was signed. So we set a goal that by 2025, 50% of our investment will be climate finance. We think we'll, we'll, that will contribute more than 50 billion US dollars by, by 2030. Um, but we've also said that we'll align all of our projects with the Paris Agreement by mid-2023. Again, it's a project that all the MDBs have been working on together. And so that means that we have to make sure that every project is climate resilient, that we have adaptation components wherever they're necessary. And obviously, as, as an institution with a particular focus on infrastructure, particularly important infrastructure assets are, are protected and that the people who use them are protected, that they're resilient not just to what we expect now, but what we expect climate change to, to throw at us in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years. And so that's something that has to be built into our understanding and assessment and our work on every single project that we finance. 
Thank you. Thank you. Joe? Thanks very much, Warren. And thank you again to both of you for co-hosting this panel. Really appreciate it. So I am coming from IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And the core remit of IFAD is to focus on the rural poor. The rural poor and small-scale farmers are essentially the ones that are most vulnerable to climate change. They are the ones who most need their investments with respect to resilience to be increased. But currently, and we estimated this last year as part of one of our studies, less than 2% of the overall new and additional climate finance flows to small-scale producers. So the first thing that I'd really want to see is to really have an order of magnitude increase in the amount of financing going to small-scale farmers, primarily because they produce one-third of the food that actually comes to our plates. They are also the food that is produced by them for every dollar that they produce. <coughs> six cents only reaches them. So clearly, we need a step change, something that is transformational. You said, Warren, that you know, currently we are expecting an uh, overall gap of about 160 to $300 billion, essentially, with respect to adaptation. If you look at mitigation, again, another study that we looked at, new and additional climate flows, for every $18 that is given to mitigation, $1 goes to adaptation, which, in, uh, in my worldview, is indefensible, because this is a question of survival today. So I'm really looking for a huge commitment with a huge change in the enabling environment as well to adaptation, to resilience, to be really focused upon uh, today and at this COP. And I really think, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to say it, I really think that the success of this COP and every other climate action is really predicated on how realistic and how real and credible those financial commitments are going to be to adaptation. One last statistic, right? For every $1.2 trillion, uh, this is the GCA, I think, came out with this report. For $1.2 trillion that you invest in adaptation, you end up preventing and generating avoided costs of $7.1 trillion. That's huge. Prevention is better than cure. Let's target that. Thanks. Thank you. Eddie? Thank you so much. I think that, that was the great uh, line opener for the Global Center on Adaptation, an organization that was created a couple of years ago with the sole focus, the obsession on pushing adaptation. Because there has been, as you said, the emphasis a lot on mitigation and it's fundamental that the world is able to stay within 1.5 degrees warming. But even at that, the action on adaptation is to start right now. And you ask about what is it that can be done to increase financing. And, and there are three important messages from the Global Center on Adaptation. First, adaptation is everybody's business. So it's not only just the public sector, because there's this sense, oh, it's the government that needs to protect us from floods, needs to deal with heat waste, needs to do that. And the reality is that the private sector, the communities, the civil society, all have an important role to play. And the private sector needs to have this financial uh, architecture to allow that all the way from the insurance companies to the individuals, to the investments they do in their housing, to the farmers that are uh, changing their crops or changing the, uh, the way in which water is managed. Ev adaptation is everybody's business. Second, um, the, a, a really important process is that adaptation is not only about uh, preventing damages. Uh, an agriculture that is adapted and resilient to climate change is a more productive agriculture. A city that is more ready for the damages of today and those of tomorrow, they are, they are going to be more intense and more frequent due to climate change, is a more productive city. And therefore, adaptation is really about incorporating what is going to be changes today, uh, because that's a step number one to get ready, and changes tomorrow for a more productive, more livable, more uh, jobs-oriented economy. And then finally is uh, information and transparency. In the reality is that financial institutions today don't even know the risks that they're facing. And therefore, the, uh, a part of our push is to say, look, if you don't know what are your risks, then you cannot take action uh, across those process. And working with uh, your organizations is to try to say, what is the risk of our portfolio? How can you really measure that? How can you use new solutions to reduce those risks? How do you use new instruments to be able to mobilize different financing? Carlos. Right, thank you very much, and thank you, ADB and AIIB, and I extend Danny for this invitation. 
and, and thank you, Eddie, because that was another fantastic segue, uh, and I must recognize it's going to be challenging to unfold. There's been so much very valuable contributions already in the panel, and I took note, and I want to come to them. But let me start, Warren, by uh, highlighting the mandate of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. That is very much a private sector-led, so right now we have 120 institutions representing 20 trillion in assets, and representing regions, industries, sectors, and institutions that have something to bring to the table. And I think that, to Ed's fantastic point, that is everyone's business, uh, but by, by, by recognition of that, we also need to have a bespoke application of resilience, what it means to each of those industries, businesses, and sectors. Uh, our primary focus is on the quality of finance. Uh, we recognize that the quantity of finance is absolutely pivotal, but as we all recognize here in the resilience space, we are facing a really acute market failure, or we could call it an information failure, as it's been uh, very nicely highlighted just now. So we don't have the right information to understand the risk that our decisions, our desired outcomes in a given time horizon, back to Danny's point about the critical importance of really having this discussion about in a time horizon framing, not about current terms, how climate risk, physical climate risk are gonna affect us and how we can discount it to present value to then understand what is the right level of current effort, be it time, investment, or, or policy. And we fail to do that. So our, uh, our effort is on the quality. So we are developing solutions, and then from there, really going to the scale up. And uh, that is absolutely urgent to bring that to the needs from governments, to investors, because at the end of the day, and I really like the point about the wonderful studies about the, the, the case of uh, avoid losses, uh, but we need to apply that to the, what it means to a government. A government wants economic, social, ecosystem continuity in a given time horizon. Uh, an investor wants risk-adjusted returns. We have a unique opportunity in time to merge the two and to deliver to those two important constituents. But I think I'll leave it for now, but thank you. Thank you. I, I guess from, from the ADB point of view, uh, as, a, as a development finance institution, we, 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 looked, we, we have a long-term strategy. We have a strategy to 2030 that gives very high priority to adaptation. But when we looked at our climate finance recently, we also found that we were falling short and, um, and, and admittedly uh, had to take a step back and, and take a very hard look at our portfolio. And what we found was that, in fact, we have the potential to incorporate climate resilience as an objective in almost every project that we do every program that we finance. Uh, and as a result, you, would have, you probably saw that our president announced recently that we increased our commitment for climate finance from 2019 to 2030 from 80 billion to 100 billion. That $20 billion is virtually all adaptation. Uh, and, it's, and, and it's based on a recognition that by tweaking how we do projects, we can actually achieve climate resilient impacts climate adaptation impacts that make, only make sense for the project. So in fact, in my hope is that, that at some point we quit, we quit talking about adaptation projects. Every project is an adaptation project. Every project needs to be climate resilient. What we need to do is identify where the gaps are. So for example, your farmers, small scale farmers, um, you know, we, we recognize that as a, a huge challenge because for an institution like us getting down to that scale is not easy. But just in the last hour, we launched a, a new um, community resilience finance facility, which is really designed to sort of apply the, the community-driven development concept, which works at the, the local farm level as well, to get the money to them through civil society, through local uh, community-based organizations, doing what they think needs to be done to become climate resilient. So I think there's, we're moving in the right direction, but still it, we're talking about going from, uh, you know, those kind of, that level of project to capitalizing on, on that private sector money that's out there. And I guess that's the holy grail uh, that we're all looking for. Let me, let me ask uh, a question to Danny now. Uh, Asia and the Pacific region is expected to see a huge increase in infrastructure investments. Such investments need to be resilient and also ensure that they are steering growth towards climate resilient pathways. 
How is AIIB supporting its clients to mobilize climate adaptation finance to meet these huge needs in the region? Thank you. I mean, I guess there are two words that are important. One is mainstream, which is what you were talking about, and one is mobilizing, which is what um, Eddie and Carlos were, were talking about. So the mainstreaming is about how do we make sure, just like you said, that adaptation and resilience is part of every project that we do. Um, and at least for every project, we're asking those questions, we're examining the climate risks, we're screening for that, and then we're making changes to the project if necessary to, to ensure that um, th that thinking is integrated into project design and, and, and implementation. And I think that's where the approach among the multilateral development banks on Paris alignment is also very important because Paris alignment means that you have to look both at mitigation and ad adaptation for every project. Even if projects are not primarily climate finance, still you have to show that you've, that you've, that you've done this. And that's a, not only is it important to achieve these objectives, it's also a value added for the clients, I think. I think the second part is, is about mobilization because um, the, the, I mean you, you gave some of the figures earlier, but the scale of the need is so enormous that this can't be financed by, um, by governments and, and, and MDBs by, by themselves. So a huge amount of private sector finance has to come into uh, to this space. And there, there are a number of things we have to do. It's about education and information, uh, de-risking, bringing, pro br bringing projects to market, project preparation so that there are projects there that the private sector can also uh, get, in, get involved in. Um, so in AIB, we have launched something we call our Sustainable Capital Markets Initiatives, which is trying to use some of our resources to try and um, uh, deliver proof of concept um, for uh, for ideas that we help, we think can help to improve the in level of information that is available to uh, investors. So one of these is um, a climate bond portfolio and a climate change information uh, framework, which uh, we are developing. We we've developed with Amundi, the asset manager, where we've put in um, five hundred million dollars of AIB finance to, to to deliver something which is looking not only. Green bonds traditionally look at the, the proceeds of the bond to assess whether those are green or not. This goes one step further and says, let's instead look at the whole issuer. Let's understand what the company as a whole that's issuing this bond is, is doing. Is it aligned with the Paris Agreement? If it is, we can invest. If it isn't, then, then but the company has good intentions and is moving in the right direction. And we in Amundi can work with the company to say, okay, this is what you need to do to get to this, um, to get to this point of view. Um, then I think that uh, we've also made investments in, in funds. For example, the Lightsmith Climate Resilient Fund is a highly innovative fund specifically focused on adaptation and, and, and resilience and is already bringing forward some new technologies. And I think if those, you know, if, if we identify successful technologies through that process, then potentially we can give further support to allow them to be rolled out more broadly across Asia. One very innovative technology is about capturing water from the air. So even in places that are suffering extreme, uh, extreme drought, this technology can help to ensure there is water available uh, under, those, under those circumstances. And then lastly, and I'm, I'm sure others will talk much more about this than, than I can, but we've been talking to Carlos and the, and the CCRI about new approaches to integrate climate risk into decision making so that um, we can deploy some of our capital to, to road test those approaches perhaps uh, and, and, and make that much more something which can be um, better understood by, by private sector investors because as we said earlier you know the the avoided losses from good climate adaptation and resilience investment are enormous that's something which ought to be able to be taken into account in private sector financial decision making in a much better way than it is at the moment I think the methodology that CCRI has developed is very powerful in that respect so let's see if we can if we can try and turn that into something which which helps to mobilize more private sector investment Thanks. I, I think that uh, you know the kinds of initiatives that you that you've taken are indicative of what all of us are striving for, which is how do we break that that uh, that mold uh, that we've got right now that sort of keeps the private sector uh, walled in from from some of these investments. So uh, we need to work together. In, in exploring, I mean, we're all gonna generate lessons over the coming couple of years and we need to make sure that we share those lessons and, and uh, there will be failures, but I think that, uh, you know, everything I'm hearing here at the COP is, is leaning in the right direction. So thanks for taking a leadership role on that. Uh,
Joe, uh, let me ask you about, uh, uh, you know, the, not only the quantity or volume of finance for climate adaptation, but what about the quality uh, in order to make sure that impacts are felt by the most vulnerable, the, the kinds of uh, small-scale farmers you were talking about? EFAD plays a critical role in strengthening resilience of smallholder farmers. What are some of the challenges that you've faced in accessing climate, climate adaptation finance that can deliver impact on the ground? And how is EFAD addressing those challenges in its operations? Okay, so I have five minutes, big question. Thanks, Warren. So first, I, I should say EFAD is an IFI, right? It, it's an international financing institution, which means not only do we do grants, but we raise money from the market, but we also lend. And we lend in loans and guarantees, and we can also invest um, equity, and we can do debt financing, and we work at the sovereign level, but we also work at the non-sovereign level. Now, one of the challenges of doing that is that we know in adaptation, actually very few countries are willing to borrow, right? Because of some of the things that you spoke about, but also Danny did, because a lot of things seem like development, and a lot of countries are not willing to to borrow for the soft parts of development. They're willing to borrow for infrastructure, but not for the soft parts of development. So a couple of examples. Uh, Vietnam, we've got an investment that has, a, it's a digital technology, which is essentially to help measure the increasing salinity in water. Traditionally, what farmers would do, they'd sort of taste the water, figure out as to you know, whether it's saline, and then their rice crops would be destroyed or not, accordingly. Right. But now with digital technology, you can figure out as to what the soil, salt content is. Now, but the challenge is, do you get scaled up adoption of technologies such as these, right? You can pilot them, but really scaling this up requires that, yes, there has to be capital investment from farmers. They need to have collateral. They need to be able to go to the bank, right? And that does require a very different way of thinking and having a pipeline of projects on one side that are innovative, so either it's whether it's digressive insurance or even resilience bonds. So for example, we're looking, we're working in some of the poorest countries of the world, but those also have very shallow capital markets. And you're not going to be able to really think about, you know, issuance of bonds in those areas. So what do you do? And you have to come in with non-lending instruments in those spaces and blend them with lending instruments so that you can really first be invested in the long run and be thinking about, well, how can you do the non-lending part? So we've got, for example, for a lot of our investments, we combine, we blend that, and we've got the Adaptation for Smallholder Farmers Program, which is now in its third incarnation. Starting this year, it's a $500 million project, which is essentially grants, but we can also on, on loan and in loan. And we combine that with almost all of our investments, so those are productive investments. And we essentially focus on building value chains for farmers so that they can really uh, be connected to markets, but we can work on financial inclusion as well. Another challenge for us, for example, remittances. This is a big challenge in Asia as well as in the Pacific, right? So uh, Tonga, for example, largest per capita remittance inflow in the world, 40% of overall GDP. But guess what? For every $200 that comes in on remittances, uh, an individual has to pay from a developing country usually, will have to pay approximately 7% on every $200. In a world that we are living in today, it seems, again, indefensible that that's not a low-hanging fruit that we should be able to deal with, to reduce transaction costs of, and increase the resilience of households that are living in spaces that are going to be really affected by climate change uncertainty and conflict. So these are essentially areas that we are focusing on. But I do want to come back to one of the points that Carlos made as well. I do agree that, yes, I think you know this has become pretty, um, it's touted a lot that this is a market failure, it's the asymmetry of information. I think there is a policy failure that we are seeing. That's why our economic and financial costs and social costs don't get reflected in our prices. And that's the big challenge. I think we're forsaking our own responsibility if we don't take that on as a challenge and instruct markets to really introduce into them risk-adjusted returns as well as the costs of climate and social transitions. Thanks very much.
So the back to the bankability uh, question, which is uh, one that we could spend several hours on, but I, you know, I, I think we have to redefine bankability in general. Uh, at a uh, the uh, last two years, GCA has been very active in increasing the political commitment for adaptation. What are some of the key challenges you see, you see for the Asia Pacific region in increasing climate adaptation finance, and how can we overcome such challenges? Absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, when we look at the numbers on adaptation financing across regions, actually Asia Pacific gets the most. And in a way, it's because the countries have more capacity and a greater recognition of the challenges of uh, climate change. The, all the way from, from typhoons to droughts to sea level rise, Asia Pacific is a region that is really in the eye of the storm. And therefore, it's actually ahead. We, we just finished a, a report on Africa. We were comparing and, and actually the, the Asia Pacific is not only ahead, but it has a much better understanding. However, there are three, four important challenges. Um, number one, um, it, it, this idea that adaptation can be handled only by mainstreaming, by doing a little bit more, uh, can only get you so far. Many of the tremendous changes that are beginning to happen on climate change require a lot more structural transformation and system and policy changes that are not going to be just uh, increasing a little bit the size of your drainage ditches or raising your port size by 50 centimeters. Um, and actually it's also because, um, for example, in the infrastructure projects that uh, ADB and AIB finance, those are going to be having a lifetime of 30, 40, 50 years or more. That's precisely the time frame of the most important changes on climate. And right now the climate models are not very good at the log small scales of a city or of a few uh, kilometers to be able to understand what's going to happen. And therefore a paradigm shift from what we used to be as engineers designing optimal infrastructure to one that is more robust to different climate futures, but also that brings nature into the combination. Because in the end, thinking that just by um, pouring more cement, the world is going to be able to uh, protect itself at a great climate is a fallacy. It is, nature is our only buffer, and that combination of gray and uh, green um, infrastructure solutions is going to be critical, but then it requires breaking silos between typical engineers and biodiversity specialists into this process. Um, third, I think that uh, there's a tremendous diversity in Asia Pacific. The challenges of Tonga versus China are completely different. Within China, the poorer provinces versus the coastal provinces are very different. And therefore, those targeted solutions, uh, instead of just blanket policies, are fundamental to that direction. And therefore, that idea of uh, learning innovation data and all to this process at the very local level becomes critical, but with a very important dimension of inequality. At the end, the ones that suffer the most are the poorer cities, are the poorer communities, are the poorer farmers that don't have the buffer to be able to withstand the shocks of climate change today and the shocks that are going to come in the future altogether. Finally, it's, um, it's really a, a question of um, the, the tools. I, I, when I look at, at climate change adaptation and finance, it reminds me of, of the 90s when we were working on energy efficiency where banks didn't know how to appraise an energy efficiency project because it was savings, it was cost avoided. And it took a good decade for the banks to realize, hey, there's a business there, and now energy efficiency is a very traditional line of business. Uh, it needs to come to that point where financial institutions look at this and they feel comfortable financing um, losses avoided, financing efficiency because you are uh, understanding the climate. Finan bringing and closing the loop, for example, on how does a city that protects uh, um, areas of, of, uh, of the urban areas from flooding have direct impacts on uh, real estate benefits, and how do you close the loops? Those kind of innovations are still very nascent, and it must be an integral part of what needs to happen in Asia Pacific. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to, when you were talking about that, it, it reminds me of the late 90s when all of a sudden the MDBs decided that our role was poverty reduction, which seems kind of silly to say now, but that's what happened. And when we then decided that we better do that, we all realized we didn't know how. 
it was time to take a step back and rethink the whole development process. And I think that that's basically what you're saying now is that we've got to take a step back and rethink climate, low carbon, climate uh, resilient development process. Um, so, uh, Carlos, for you, compared to mitigation finance, private sector involvement in adaptation finance remains very limited, as you mentioned earlier. While there are many challenges, can you share some innovative practices that are helping increase engagement of private sector in financing adaptation? And if you have a good answer, then I'd like to invite you to Manila to uh, give a talk to our uh, folks there. That's a wonderful challenge, and I accept it. <laughs> Warren, thank you very much. Uh, and again, I need, to, I need to draw on the excellent remarks that have been just been made. But to start answering your question, our main form of innovation is collaboration, is genuine collaboration. And within CCRI, we have no words to describe our gratitude for that true engagement across industry sectors and competitors to work together to find a solution to this conundrum of this market failure. Uh, Joe, I cannot agree more to the point about the policy failure. But again, at the end of the day, maybe we should really walk back to the heart of this issue that is purely scientific and analytical. And Edith has been also alluding to that, to the need of climate models to, to really speak to the future of exposure and of vulnerability and financial materiality, whatever financial materiality is interpreted for. Is it for GDP inflation interest rate? Is it for smallholder farmers? Or is it for a portfolio investment? There is, a, there is an interpretation of financial materiality for each of them. And we're working towards those uh, in a very bespoke manner. And if I may simplify our work into two key areas. One is to support government national decision making. And answering the exact question of how can I better assess and how can I better manage my exposure, as Danny said before, on a given time horizon to physical climate risks. So we are developing a systemic resilience metric that will provide a government a sense of current exposure, but also projected exposure of national value, national value uh, it, it maybe too simplistic, but economic, social ecosystem. And then a national investment prioritization tool that we are actually launching in an hour at the UK Pavilion with Minister Charles from Jamaica and the UK government and the GCF and the University of Oxford that we believe is going to be one of the first and indeed GCA we've been partnering a wonderful and learning so much from their work in similar projects in, in Africa. Uh, it's going to allow for the identification of what are the top 30 projects, top investments at national level that for which each unit of fiscal capacity is going to protect the most economic, social, and environmental value in a given time horizon. So that if we provide the two solutions, we are allowing a government to then unlock what we could characterize as political return. And that is, how can I, uh, uh, as a policymaker, have a, a immediate recognition of my good management in terms of a metric? So if I follow those indications of a priority, how that reflects immediately in terms of that, of that metric. And that metric, with a desperate need to, to have any proxy value to sovereign credit quality and to that macro uh, aura to that. Then we go at the asset level, because of course it, doesn't, uh, it, it is for nothing if we identify 30 top projects where we are protecting the most economic value, but then we design and we structure them in a way that they're not gonna be performing in that future state of the world where you know, we are gonna have a higher frequency and severity of climate events. It will all be for nothing. So we have a very distinctive working group where we are working in an initial set of 39 real projects, real data infrastructure that have been filtered to five initial and for which we have developed a physical climate risk assessment methodology. It's a methodology that really runs us from Climate risk considerations, that, that is crucial because of course, if that input is not high quality, then the rest is for nothing. So we have seven climate risk data providers working on a pro bono basis, collaborating between them and delivering assessment for each of the assets. Then we have engineering firms, and I must recognize Maud McDonald, they have dedicated 15 colleagues over a period of a year to develop an adjustment to CAPEX, OPEX, and depreciation of each individual asset. Then we have S&P Global, both ratings, market intelligence, with a wonderful team of eight people over a year that they have developed a, a simulation on the impact on credit quality associated to the adjustments to CAPEX and OPEX and certain prescriptions. 
And then we have a wonderful group of pension funds, asset managers, banks, that they are interpreting all of these in terms of weighted average cost of, cost of capital, net present value, internal rate of return. So really bringing the kind of an end-to-end -end interpretation, because, and I will finish with that, Warren, uh, I want to go back to the, the, the driver for participation from many institutions. Uh, we were born with three trillion represented, and now we are 20 trillion represented. And in this journey, what really has driven and attracted actors, and I would say public-private, is the recognition that we finally have an opportunity here. Uh, it is a risk because we are exposing economic human value. But there is an opportunity because we see how regulation is going in a very decisive direction. We, ha we see how analytics are improving on an exponential basis. We see how rating agencies and credit markets are really starting to recognize this. And we see the impact and pressure from stakeholders. So we see a point in the future, it may be one year, two years, where the system, and back to the paradigm shift, is going to be better interpreting this. Because now, there are investors in our coalition that they told us that today is not that they don't feel recognized on the resilience action, it's that they are penalized. When they go into a competitive process and they recognize physical climate risk and they increase the, the initial capex, they go back to the end of the line. And that is a tragedy because we need to adjust. But we are adjusting that and, and the, uh, I, I will finalize, and now I, I, I promise, uh, with saying that the opportunity is now uh, because and we could argue as there's an arbitrage opportunity for governments and investors. But if we take too long, this will be not so much about the opportunity but about minimizing losses and that will be the ultimate tragedy. Thanks. I'm gonna, Carlos, I'm gonna, the next question is for everybody, but I'm going to start with you because it's an immediate follow-up and I have to ask uh, an additional question anyway. So the question is, uh, it's recognized that addressing climate adaptation needs requires long-term financing that can be delivered through a range of institutions at regional, national, subnational, and local level and blended with other finances to generate wider impacts. So the question is, what actions are needed to improve the enabling environment for such long-term financing to flow and have an impact on the ground. And Carlos, in particular for you, I'd be very keen on your view of the importance of sovereign risk mitigation uh, guarantees uh, to, to free up that both, both the more conventional private sector money, but more important, the holy grail, which is the institutional money. Absolutely right, and thank you, Warren. And uh, as I said, in, in one hour time, we have Minister Charles and the, the government of Jamaica has been an absolute champion within CCRI, and they have brought that consideration front and central. Or if we could maybe rephrase it, what we call the risk of pricing risk. So for vulnerable countries, if we focus solely on understanding risk at the sovereign level, the consequences can be very negative. And we want to attract capital, not to scare capital. So in that regard, to to facilitate a solution to that, there is management, management, management. But then there is the, as you are alluding to, the need for a very uh, a concerted action and for different industries and sectors to understand their contribution with uh, an element of that recipe for, for success. And it's not all going to be private capital, as you alluded to. And in that regard, uh, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment is already starting discussions about the leak of investment fund for resilience. There's going to be a series of investment vehicles that all are going to have very common attributes. One is applying CCRA solutions for the origination, screening, and valuation of individual case studies, uh, uh, transactions. But then also they need to align with national needs. And as they will align with national needs, then also having a discussion about what other instruments, be it policy incentives, be it resharing incentive, be it uh, risk capital, be it risk transfer, that can be brought so we can really provide that enabling environment for that desperate capital that we need. Because as you alluded, and sometimes I, we struggle to, to communicate, this is not about private capital, this is about capital and about instruments, and the market failure affects all instruments, from ODA to technical assistance to private capital to risk transfer. So we have a unique opportunity to really provide that central space with empirical evidence about the solution, and on the basis of that, attract certain instruments that, if I may, in the past maybe they have been requested in, in not so kind of a clear, you know, proof of concept basis, and, and therefore there is reluctance, and we cannot be more, more respectful of that, but there is a unique opportunity to mobilize them efficiently now. 
Thank you. Eddie? No, I think that, look, you have to focus on the fact that I think that the issue of Pacific Islands uh, and their vulnerability and their special needs on financing uh, requires a special solution. But when you say also uh, long-term financing, while well, I agree, the urgency and the returns to investments in adaptation uh, have been shown by us and many others that they are so high that actually says uh, is the lack of understanding and the lack of practicality to move uh, in, in that direction. Uh, the, the, the third point that we, we try to say is that um, many of, of uh, these uh, investments are actually um, part of uh, good uh, development, but they don't have enough, there's not enough information on how to do those transformations. So I think that uh, that ability to test and that ability to learn from each other and that ability to move fast in, in that direction becomes really critical. And, and one of the areas where, for example, we, we are trying to push really hard is uh, on climate information systems. The, the ability of um, households and farmers and cities and, and ministries of transport to take preventive actions against the next uh, climate disaster, but also to start making choices that are more informed, uh, are directly related and whether they have information on climate at their fingertips and they know what to do and what choices to make based on that information. That doesn't require a long-term investment, that doesn't require a lot. It requires a very coordinated process and a lot of education and a lot of um, support so that from the farmer to a, uh, a slum dweller to a mayor of a small city or a mayor of a mega city, they understand what is it that's gonna happen because you now are able to know that if La Nina is coming, what is the consequences for the next six months? That if the cyclone is coming in 72 hours, what is it that it needs to be done into this process? A household needs to move furniture from the first floor to the second floor because that's where you're gonna be moving that process. If you have 72 hours, you know exactly what is it that you need to do. Um, a major is able to start moving certain people from certain areas. If you know that there are certain degradation processes on the environment that are taking place and these are the consequences on climate, informed choices are uh, really at the core of that process. And therefore information for us is, is a key part of, of all the process. And yes, uh, financial instruments is critical, but if and we don't have the ability of every member of society to understand what climate is affecting them today and what climate is gonna affect them tomorrow. Because remember, even in local communities that have that local knowledge of what are the, the importance of climate, they're gonna get overwhelmed with the frequency and intensity of those changes very soon. They are already feeling that. That information is gonna be at the end critical for them. Let me, let me push you a little bit on, on from the small scale to the big scale. So you worked in the urban sector for a long time. In Asia, we have most of our cities, developing country cities, are heavily under-infrastructured, under-invested in just basic infrastructure. Trillions of dollars required to catch up even if we didn't have climate change. Now we do, so where do they get the money for that? Well, the reality is that if you think that that's an additional cost, you're looking at the problem the wrong way. Uh, the damages that are happening and the reconstruction cost from not building the infrastructure and from not doing the urban plan in the right way are orders of magnitude higher than uh, what you need to invest. In many places, actually, our calculation is that with 3 to 4% additional cost, you are making infrastructure a lot more resilient. Uh, we just calculated, for example, in this new study on state and trends of adaptation in Africa, not only how much does it cost for agriculture to become more resilient, 15 billion, but what is the cost of inaction on the losses and on the process and on, on the emergencies and all that is 215 billion. So looking at, uh, which many, uh, unfortunately, many majors are facing with that, look, uh, we don't have enough money to do that additional practice is actually the inverse. You don't do that, that's the cost. However, the real challenge in a way is the encroachment into flooding areas, is the inability to connect the upstream watersheds that are providing the water to the city. It is actually not having sufficient green spaces and sufficient uh, tree cover 
to handle uh, heat waves that are happening to this process. And uh, it is all those combinations of factors that are part of good urban planning. But remember, a city that grows in a way is impossible to change. The urban shape of Paris and London has been the same for the last 250 years. The uh, shape of Manila today is impossible to change. And therefore, the choices for the rapidly growing cities of Asia are fundamental in terms of adapting to climate, saving nature, being able to handle the mangroves, being able to protect the um, floodplains in a way that is a lot cheaper, uh, it, it, but it requires a lot better planning in that process. And, and coming out of this COP is a huge push, push for nature-based solutions, which I think EFAD is in a wonderful position to, to help move in that direction. But the same question in terms of, of the, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier the difficulty of, of convincing your clients to borrow for what they perceive as a, a soft sector, but as Eddie just said, that it's actually just borrowing for good development. Um, but if you, if you look at the tenure of, of what you uh, require for those clients and even for small-scale farmers, uh, how is EFAD dealing with that? Thanks, Warren. So we actually want to start with uh, where Eddie left off. Current official development assistance is $160 billion. Yeah? The overall adaptation gap that is likely to be there for developing countries by 2030 is going to be between 160 to $300 billion. Guess what? If we make the $160 billion, which is ODA, more climate resilient, more adaptive, we've got half of that gap covered. Right? So it doesn't all have to be additional. We can actually repurpose a lot of the aid flows in current time into ways, in ways that are climate resilient and adaptive and low emissions, right? So that's one. But the second part, and I, I'm going to come back to this primarily because I do think that we keep calling it a market failure, but I, I keep wanting to say that it is a policy failure. I'm a woman. I love diamonds. Diamonds have absolutely no use in the world, yet we have a market for it. We have standards, we have norms, people love buying them, people love investing in them. Why do we have to wait for another 50 years? For, and I'm also an economist, so I love data. But we don't have to wait for another 50 years for a risk-adjusted climate model to tell me that this is really important. If diamonds can be valued in the world today, what we require is a change in norms and a change in regulations and a change in policy. Let's change that. Yeah? So that's one. I think the other part of me is the economist part of me, right? So I love data. One of the things that we are also recognizing is that it is possible to measure the incremental value of our investments on climate resilience at the household level. So at IFAD, we have developed this methodology which looks at and has been able to say that, look, a 30, that an increase in investment of X dollars leads to, say, a 13% increase in climate resilience. We are able to measure that in Mali, in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India. We are able to measure that. We are also able to recognize and appreciate the locally-led adaptive mechanisms that are clearly required for adaptation which are not as glitzy and not as shiny as perhaps the solar panels that are required at a large scale, although decentralized, um, decentralized renewable is another form of adaptation too. Right? So recognizing that, I think it's also important that we start to measure that in far more focused ways. So we've got, we develop counterfactuals. What would have happened in the absence of the investment that EFAD makes in the same agroecological and policy zones, but that are not receiving EFAD investments? And guess what? You get the counterfactual and you get a standard error as well as a standard estimate, which you can aggregate across your entire portfolio to then measure resilience. My last point, I was in Namibia. And I know it's not the Asia Pacific, but I think it's telling, again, the limitations of markets, right? I was in Namibia when I was still at the Green Climate Fund two and a half years ago. There was a three-year drought that the country had faced, and we looked for insurance companies to come into Namibia. The premiums were just too high. They knew they were not going to make any money there. They didn't come in. So yes, 
Markets are important, but they're only that limited. And I think we've got to be far more intentional in the way policy gets made so that we can make it profitable. Thank you. Thank you. And, and your point on repurposing, I think, is very relevant to both of us because of our commitment to the Paris alignment. Uh, Danny, the same question to you, please. I think this idea of repurposing the diamond market to get the flows flowing into climate resilience and adaptation is a, is a great one in its own right. Um, I mean, I think that there are a lot of the threads that have already been drawn out in this, in this conversation. I mean, the human mind looks for very simple solutions to big problems, and there isn't one silver, silver bullet here. Instead, we have to have uh, innovation, we have to try things, um, we have to learn from them and, uh, and apply those that work and, 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 and move on. I think there's also a role for technology here. Um, you know, through the Lightsmith investment that I mentioned earlier, that's identifying already some new technologies that can be potentially, which are specifically focused on adaptation, um, which could make a difference in communities uh, uh, all over the world. So then the, 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 the speed of information and knowledge sharing and, and it has to be um, accelerated. Um, I also think that I mean, several people on this panel have already mentioned the importance of partnerships. Completely agree. Whether it's uh, whether it's co-financing projects together, whether it's um, you know learning from partnerships in terms of innovation and and and, and information, critically uh, uh, important. I do also think that tying this back to the nature-based solutions, which 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 you raised and which has been it was a big theme here at COP26 last week, is 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 critically important. You know, n n nature knows better in many cases than uh, you know human engineers how to solve these problems, and so you know, building nature-based solutions much more into the work of, of institutions like ours is, uh, is, is, is very important. I think from AIB's point of view, some of our projects are designed to try and generate some of that information that can help to ensure that the market is, uh, is, 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 is better informed, and then putting in place metrics and, and information that helps people to understand these, uh, these risks uh, better. Um, I also think the, the point about um, uh, the urban infrastructure and the development opportunities in, uh, uh, to integrate climate adaptation from an early stage is really important. Before going to AIB, I was a minister in the British government, um, in the Treasury, and um, we developed a project, the UK developed a project called the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which is trying to adapt the infrastructure of London, which has been in place for, in some cases, you know, a century or more, um, to, uh, to, to water quality standards and, and to flood risk. Um, and that's a, a massive, expensive project to retrofit that into an already established infrastructure. So if we can get these solutions right and we can mainstream them into projects, especially urban infrastructure projects, then you give, um, hopefully, the cities that you're investing in a chance to have resilience built in from the, from the, from the very start. So I think uh, those are the kind of things that AIB, ADB, other NGBs need to really look at and, 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 and mainstream into, into all of our work, both adaptation-specific projects and also every other project having adaptation and resilient built in. Thank you. So uh, just, just before we have one last round, I, 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 I want to come back on the policy agenda because I think that when we look at the instruments that we have and, and the World Bank certainly has similar uh, instruments. They, we see a real demand, an increasing demand for policy-based lending. Um, we have, uh, and most of that is about building national, subnational, and local capacity, changing regulatory frameworks, changing institutions, getting them uh, invest, recognition by governments that they have to invest to get ready for the changes that are that are already taking place, but that are going to accelerate uh, and and get much more severe over time. So we, when I mentioned the the additional twenty billion dollars for ADB in climate finance uh, over the coming years, probably a fairly large part of that will be policy based, uh, where where governments recognize that there's an investment required to get ready. Uh, and to react and to attract the private sector, to get the regulatory framework right, uh, to get the, the kinds of financial flows into the right place at the right time. We have five minutes left, a uh, little less than five minutes. So if I could ask each of you to spend one minute 
on any final thoughts. Uh, Danny, I'd like to start with you, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, this discussion has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I think one of the questions that we're sometimes asked is, by talking about adaptation and resilience, are you somehow neglecting mitigation? Um, and I think that, that, that the, the truth is that both of them have to be dramatically scaled up. Um, and so the, the, what we're talking about in this panel, which is how do we mobilize private sector investment? How do we, for, for, for adaptation and resilience, how do we create the information, create the knowledge, create the innovation that enables uh, uh, those flows to take place is critically important. And it, and it sits alongside the work we're doing to to support climate change mitigation. The two are essential, they have to go together. Communities around the world are already living with 1.1 degrees of, of, of warming as the IP that's already taken place. That's already having consequences. We've seen in the last year horrific flooding, uh, fires, all sorts of other natural disasters. That's just gonna get worse, even if our mitigation efforts are as successful as we would like them to be. Um, and so this is a critical counterpart and it has to be embedded in our thinking across the piece. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Warren. So I'm going to say what I said at the beginning. Unless this COP is able to deliver on its adaptation commitments in, and make credible commitments, uh, I, I don't think that we will call it a success. Um, the one-to-one -one ratio that was promised in Paris must come through. And I also think that if we are going to create the required enabling environment, um, while recognizing that norms and policies and standards are the way to go, especially for me, I do think that it's almost lexicographic, get that right, everything else will follow. But um, I think you know, if we can incorporate into economic and financial analysis some of the pricing, some of the values that we do want this world to imitate, that's where we could start as well. And that's what we are doing uh, within EFAD. We've already put our money where our mouth is. So more than 50% of our overall climate finance does go to adaptation. And we are essentially asking you know, the global community to commit much more. Thanks. Thank you. Eddie? Uh, look, I'll say faster knowledge exchange. Um, the traditional way in which development has learned has been a project is done, after five years lessons are extracted and then they get shared, so another country after seven years begin to test and replicate. There's no time for that anymore. We need to figure out the practical solutions of how Fonafin in Mexico has created a resilient financial and insurance infrastructure to move into this process, how the, so the adapted social protection of Ethiopia can be replicated at a scale fast now. How does the Philippines, with its uh, community-driven development that now is used for disaster reconstruction for climate changes? How the financial insurance uh, scheme of the Caribbean in CRIF moved to PICRAFI in the Pacific? That process needs to be accelerated uh, orders of magnitude to be able to learn and share and compare to, uh, for transformation. And part of our function in the uh, Global Center for Adaptation as, uh, as a knowledge broker is to move into this direction. But uh, the, 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 the changing is happening so fast. And, and if you see today, the changes on climate change are happening much faster than any of the models are predicted. Glaciers have been melting faster. The Antarctic are melting faster. The frequency and intensity of the hurricanes have been increasing faster than the models are saying. And therefore, there's no time to lose faster knowledge sharing, comparing, contrasting, replicating, I think needs to be part of the solution. Yep. Thank you. Finally, Carlos, please. So I, I, my first reflection is, is that if we look back at this discussion 10 years ago, uh, the evolution in the sophistication and the topic is very encouraging. Uh, and we are at a level of discussion that, that really is bringing us close to what you say. That is not arithmetic, arithmetic progression, it's that we need a quantum change. And, but, but the sense is that we, are, we may be getting close to that. So absolutely your point, we need to keep pushing, pushing despite the promising and encouraging progress today. The second is that, uh, as Joe may have alluded and Danny too, this, this kind of false choice between resilience and mitigation, I think we broke it finally. And there is an, an, there's an element of, of self-criticism to, to what that was before, and maybe my personal, uh, let me take it. But over the, the last 10 years, we may have sent a wrong message that is almost like, don't worry about mitigation, you can be resilient. 
And that is not our message. Our message is you can be resilient only in a very ambitious future state of the world with mitigation. There are certain states of the world for which resilience there has no place. It's about just, it's gonna be about surviving. So sending that message and recognizing that the importance of the resilience is to, in a way, finalize the, the case for really ambitious mitigation action because we are gonna be able to really convey how inviolable the future may be in the face of physical climate risks. Okay, well let me uh, thank you all. This has been really good. I think the, the, the takeaway is, is uh, knowledge sharing, policy reform, mobilize money, do projects where it makes sense so they're climate resilient and low carbon, and do it all faster and at scale. And uh, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure being with you today. Thank you.